Hello and welcome to another Physics 232 live stream brought to you by Portland State University. And we are going to be covering today current resistance, resistivity, Ohm's law, and a bunch of fun things like that, getting into circuits eventually. Uh, start off with, I want to share a few links in the chat, starting with a link to the Learning Center. That's a tutoring page at the Learning Center at Portland State University. They have a a lot of great resources there as well as their Facebook and Instagram page definitely check them out and follow them on Facebook and Instagram if you haven't yet and then finally uh, there's an attendance sheet here we ask you to fill out if you're coming here for the class uh, the information will get passed along to your teacher and let's get started talking about current so current is defined it's usually a little I or a bit I depending on the situation you have, have it, but current is going to be equal to the change in charge Q divided by the change in time. So we can see it's the amount of charge that kind of passes through an area uh, over a period of time. And the unit for this, we usually call it current is in amps, which are equal to coulombs per second. And if we were to draw a circuit here, I'm going to draw a value of a resistor here to start off with. And I'm going to connect that through around the battery. Oops. So this is a positive charge there. The flow of current is going to be going from the positive side around into the negative side. So that's the flow of current. The flow of electrons, however, are flowing from the negative side out this way. So it's really, they defined current before they knew what an electron was, is what it comes down to it. The scientists hadn't caught up to what the science actually was. And they were defining current coming out of what they called the positive side. And so they said it flows from the positive to negative, and really it's electrons that are flowing from the negative into the positive side. But when, when we talk about current, that convention is still around, where current is going to be the flow, the opposite of the flow of electrons. It's going to come out of the positive into the negative. And in any circuit, you need some type of resistance in there, otherwise it, if you have a resistance of zero, basically electricity can flow very uh, quickly through there, and you you get a lot of power being drained all at once. It's usually when you see sparks fly and other fun things like that. So having a, at least a little bit of resistance in there is a very good thing. Um, and we can define current in this regard as e equal to N times E over time. So that's the number of electrons that are flowing uh, per time. And the charge of electron in this case is going to be a negative charge. So it's kind of going in the opposite direction. Or N is equal to to the number of electrons. E is the charge of the electrons. That's in coulombs. Just put a big C. And T is time. Uh, writing two T's confuses my brain sometimes in seconds and the way that the electrons flow they're not just flying through the air necessarily flying around the circuit they kind of move their way slowly through the wire slowly relative to um, like the speed of light for example so they're not moving at the speed of light but they do end up moving very fast and we can calculate what they call the drift speed of electrons so if I were to draw a copper wire Going down like this, it's a weird circle. Let's tighten that out a little bit. That's a bit better. And we said electrons kind of start here, where it's kind of the the pole of that, that positive charge is going to kind of start making electrons flow this way, and they're going to bounce kind of around in there in all different ways, eventually making their way out to here. But really, it's not just one electron. It's like a consistent flow of electrons. It's like one electron 
electron that's nearest to this positive charge is going to pop over to that next one, causing a slightly positive charge here, which puts in a pull, 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 pull. So that positive charge is really pulling the electrons down the wire, and it does it kind of slowly, kind of one atom at a time, one electron at a time, just pulling, pulling through there. And we can calculate that drift velocity as well, based off of the current. So we can say that the current is equal to N E A of V D, where in this case A is equal to the cross section. cross-sectional area, and VD is your drift velocity. So it's really the velocity that electrons are essentially flowing through wire. Mm -hmm. So, so <clears throat> let's try some of these out here. So looking at this problem, what is the current in millimeters? Produced, maybe that may be milliamp, milliamps produced by the solar cell in the pocket calculator through which 4.8 coulombs of charge passes through 3.2 in 3.2 hours. So here we have 4.8 coulombs of charge passing through a, a wire. In this case, it's in a pocket calculator, which passes in a time of 3.2 two hours. So we can use that idea okay, that I is equal to kind of Q over T, right? We saw that delta Q over delta T. Once we have that change in time, basically, here's the charge that goes through it, that delta Q, and here's the delta T. So I can say that's equal to 4.8 coulombs per, and it says 3.2 hours. We want that value in in seconds. So we have to convert it. So convert it down here, 3.2 hours times there's going to be 60 minutes in an hour times there's going to be 60 seconds in a minute. Do a little bit of cancellation of units and dimensional analysis. And that's going to be equal to Let's plug that into our calculator. 3.2 times 60 times 60 is going to be in seconds. A new one. So 3.2 times 60 times 60, value in seconds. That's 11,520. So 11,520 seconds. So we can divide this by 1, 11, 5, 20 seconds. And we can find out the amps that are actually going through there. So 4.8 coulombs, which is quite a lot of coulombs, divided by that many seconds is going to equal 0 0.000417 amps. So that's 0.417 milliamps. 0.417 milliamps. And this should be milliamperes. Now, milliamperes. So that's how we can find the current flowing through if we know the amount of charge and we know the time. Because the units of current is really the charge that passes per second. Moving on, in this question, we have a kind of a large flashlight, it's a really bright flashlight, and the distance from the bulb itself to the switch that it's on there is 11.6 centimeters. So let me draw this circuit out for us. And kind of have, I'm going to draw, I'm not an artist, so I'm going to diagram this out for you, I'll say. This is my little light bulb. That's my little filament in the light bulb. I know light bulbs don't have filaments anymore, but in this case, we're looking at a simple resistance incandescent light bulb. And, and we have that connected up in a circuit. And actually, this last part, there's a switch. This is 
the symbol for a switch where it's kind of it's an open circuit and you can close it where it's connected so this part over here represents a switch this is my light bulb this is my battery again this is the positive charge of the battery there so what they're saying is the distance from the switch this distance from here to where that switch is is 11.6 centimeters and they want to know calculate the drift velocity for the electrons to drift that distance in the flashlight <coughs> which is made of copper when that copper has a radius of 0 0.472 millimeters and it can carry a current of one amp. It gives you a note that there are 8.49 times 10 to the 28 electrons per unit volume, in meters cubed in this case. So I'm going to write down just the variables we know so we can start to calculate this. So I'm going to say the distance, go with little d, is equal to, I'm going to change 11.6 centimeters into meters. So that's 1.16 meters. Okay. We don't know the drift velocity. That's what we're looking for. We know that the number of electrons, or NE, is equal to 8.49 times 10 to the 28th power. In this case, that's the number of electrons, right? Yeah. So we need to multiply those by their charge. Their charge being... 1.16, I think. Let me double check my calculator. My calculator knows best. 1.6 times 10 to the 19 coulombs. Threw an extra one in there in my brain. 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. And that's going to be per meter cubed. So that whole value, let's calculate that out real quick so we have good value for it. That was 8.49 times 10 to the 28th power. And this is all going to be the number of coulombs times my charge on electron times uh, meter cubed, I guess per meter cubed. That's 1.36 to the, or times 10 to the 10th coulombs per meter cubed. 1.36 times 10 to the 10th power coulombs per meter cubed. Now, what else did they give us here? We need to find, ultimately, we're going to use this equation here. I should have written this earlier. That the current is equal to NEAVD. So, we've defined NE, which is this. We, we've defined, we need to find VD, so we need to find that area. And that's the cross-sectional area of the wires. So, if the wire had radius of radius of the wire is equal to 0 0.472 millimeters. Converting that to meters, I'm just going to throw a times 10 to the negative 3 on there. Makes it re really easy. And we can then calculate that cross-sectional area based off of the radius. So the area, in this case of a circle, or the cross-section of a cylinder, is going to be equal to pi times r squared in this case is pi times 0 0.472 times 10 to the negative third meters squared. Plugging that guy into our calculator. Pi times 0 0.472 times 10 to the negative three. Make it meters. Square the plot. Oops, forgot the two. Is 6.998, or say 6.999 times 10 to the negative 7 meters squared. 
So this is equal to 6.999 times 10 to negative 7 meters squared. So now we have that area that we need. Now we have everything we need. Let's just plug them in. Rest this plug and chug. That's 1.36 times 10 to the 10th. Or, yeah. It's coulombs per meters cubed times the area. We just calculated that. 6.999 times 10 to the negative 7 meters squared times the oh, VD, which is actually what we're looking for. So we actually need to solve this for that drift velocity. In this case, they tell us the current is 1 amps. So just rearranging this guy, use a magic pen. And dividing by the, the current divided by the uh, number of electrons times the charge of the electrons passed through per volume and the sectional area. In this case, this is one amp. We can solve for this velocity. <clears throat> so let's do that. So plugging in one amp divided by really at this value here times this value here. And we get 0 0.00105 meters per second. So that's the velocity of the electrons. So they're not going near the speed of light. We like to think of electricity as being really quick. You flip the light switch, the lights come on. But it's, it's actually going relativistically slow. 105 meters per second. Remember the speed of light is equal to about 300,000 kilometers per second. So the speed of light is a lot faster than the distance that uh, this drift velocity the electrons flow. And you can speed it up depending on the radius of the wire. You can see if we were to change the cross-sectional area. If that cross-sectional area gets... Where do we use that? Here. Right? If that cross-sectional area get bigger, we can see how it would change the overall equation. If it gets smaller, we can, it would change the overall equation too. But this isn't necessarily how fast the current flows. Not, it's really just how fast a single electron is kind of working its way through the wire. The second you turn on that wire, the electron closest to source kind of goes in and pushes and pulls all of them, the rest of them through. Let's look at this one. How long does it take the electron to travel the distance from the on-off switch to the light bulb? So we just calculated that velocity down here. So I'm going to paste that up here. The drift velocity is equal to 0 0.000105 meters per second. And we want to know the time it takes to travel that distance. And the distance here was 0 0.16 meters. So if we wanted to figure out how long it took for a second, we could just do 0 0.116 meters divided by 0 0.000105 meters per second. Notice my units, my meters are going to cancel. My seconds goes up to the top. Plugging that into our calculator. One point one zero four point three six seconds. One one zero four point three six seconds. So that's that's a lot of seconds. Let's change that to minutes, just so it kind of makes a little bit more sense. Just to change it to minutes. Do a little dimension analysis. We know that seconds and minutes are an easy conversion. There's Oops, 60 seconds per minute. So doing that, we can cancel out our seconds. 
and we can see if we just divide that by 60 we can get the number of minutes there are in there so I can divide by 60 and I'll just say percent so my calculator will change it back to seconds oh I multiplied oh no That's better. 18.406 minutes. 18.406 minutes. So let's talk a little bit now <clears throat> about resistivity in general. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, resistivity kind of talks about how resistant uh, a wire can be, and we talk and we define this resistivity mathematically by this value rho, which is a resistivity constant. Every metal can have a different constant at different temperatures. Divide multiplied by the length divided by the area. Again, this is the cross-sectional area, so we have the length is equal to L, length of the wire, or whatever you have the electricity flowing through, just that length of it. And we're gonna divide that by the area. I'm sorry, yeah, divided by the area. So I'm just gonna put area equals area cross-section. So if you have a square or a cubic metal object that the electricity is flowing through, you're going to be taking a kind of a square or rectangular cross-section. For the sake of a wire, it's always going to be like a circular one. We're going to assume it's like a perfect circle for simplicity's sake. And this is going to be temperature dependent. That's important. So as the wire gets hotter, the resistor, the resistivity goes up. As the wire gets colder, the resistivity goes down. And a lot of times, that's why we would, you know, super cool a computer that's running really hot. So it, those electric electrons run faster through everything, and we get faster data transfers and the fun things like that. We can calculate the difference in res resistivity, where R is equal to the say rho initial, rho naught times L over A because the length and the area won't change. The length might change a little, little bit because metal does expand and contract, but we're going to assume that it stays the same. And we're going to multiply that times 1 plus some alpha constant, delta T. And that alpha constant is going to talk about how the resistivity basically changes. Mm -hmm. We can also equate this to the initial resistance value times 1 plus alpha delta T. Because this value here is basically the initial resistance. Mm. <coughs> and talk a little bit about Ohm's law, because that can get us into Ohm's law a little bit. So Ohm's law uses not just resistance, but voltage and current. And we've talked a lot about voltage in a week or two past. We talked about capacitance last week, and we talked about current a little bit earlier today. And Ohm's law says there's a relationship between resistance and voltage and current, where the resistor, resistance is equal to, to uh, the voltage divided by the current. Where if you had one volt that was carrying one amp, We would have a resistance of one ohm, and I can write this as one volt divided by one amp is equal to one ohm, and that's where we get this correlation between ohms law. And we could also define the voltage across the voltage drop across any resistor or any type of load to equal so the voltage drop. 
say D to drop is equal to the negative of IR. So when we have a circuit like we did back, back here, we can say, say for this one, the bulb has some resistance to it. And we can calculate that voltage drop based off of <coughs> the current that's going through there and the voltage that's there that's being applied across that circuit. And <coughs> using that, we can uh, account for a lot of different things. So we'll talk more about that when we get into Kirchhoff's Law probably next week. Let's go to a problem. To what temperature must you raise a copper wire, originally at 23 degrees C, to double its resistance, exactly any change in dimension? And they give us value for alpha or A at 3.9 times 10 to the negative 3. And the units for that is 1 per degree C. There should be a little degrees there. So that's Celsius. So using the equation that we just brought up before, this resistance is equal to the initial resistance times 1 plus A delta T. We can use that to calculate what it needs to be. And this question is asking us to double its resistance. So we can actually say that R is equal to the 2 of our initial. So plugging that in, 2 R naught is equal to R naught times 1 plus A, A delta D. And then that lets us cancel out the initial resistance. We don't actually need to know what what that resistance is, we just can cancel it out and we want to know the change. Okay, the change is in resistance two. We want to know what temperature makes that change. So this whole value here needs to equal two. So doing the math, two minus one divided by A is going to equal our delta or change in temperature, which is equal to just one over A. Now, they give us a value for A, so we can plug that in. That's 1 over 3.9 times 10 to the negative 3. That's per degree C. Is equal to our change in temperature. So let's find out what that is. Mm -hmm. 1 divided by 3.9 times 10 to the negative 3. And I'm going to need to, well, I should do this first. Mm. I'm just trying to get my temperature unit on there because I like my units. There it is. Uh, um, this is 1 over degree C. I just threw the degree, degree C up top. And that gives us 256.41 degrees C. Celsius. 256.41. So that's the change. The change in temperature. And we can find the final temperature. We know the initial temperature then. So we know the initial was 23 degrees C. So that delta T, which is going to equal T final minus the initial which is going to equal this uh, 256.41 degrees C. We can see that T final minus 23 degrees C is going to equal 256.41 degrees Celsius. So therefore, the final temperature is equal to 256.41 degrees C plus 23 degrees C. We could add those together. That's going to equal 279.41 degrees Celsius. And that's going to be the final temperature of our copper wire, which was originally at 23 degrees C, if we were to double its resistance just by changing the temperature. <coughs> this happen in household wiring under ordinary circumstances. This is a very hot temperature. If that happened, most likely your circuit breaker would blow really quickly 
long before it got to that point. If it did get to that point, it would probably start a fire. So let's hope it doesn't happen under ordinary circumstances. No. More likely, the <coughs> the heat change would, would start making it so the length of the wire would stretch and the radius of it would get thinner. And that would cause more resistance change than anything else. Try this guy. Find the voltage drop in an extension cord having a 0.075 ohm resistance through a 4.5 through which 4.5 amps is flowing. So in here we are going to use the basic idea that V is equal to IR. And here they give us resistance and they give us the amperage. So since we have resistance and amperage, we can say that the voltage is equal to 0 0.075 ohms divided by 4.5 oh, I'm sorry not divide by times 4.5 amps mm -hmm. 0 0.075 ohm times 4.5 amps is equal to 0 0.3375 volts Oops. Yeah. is equal to 0 0.3375 volts and that's the voltage going through there if we had a cheaper cord that utilized the thinner wire and had a resistance of just or a higher resistance of 0 0.15 ohms with the same average what would the voltage drop be so here calculating that that's 0 0.15 ohms times 4.5 volts is going to equal 0.15 ohms which gives us 0 0.675 volts so that's how much volts are going down there the voltage drop of the circuit so if it started off at 125 volts coming out of our wall it would drop by 0.675 volts by the time it got to our appliance so using those same values find the power dissipated for each of those extensions so the power uh, we haven't talked much about power but power is equal to current times voltage so if you've got 120 volts coming out of your wall and you plug it into a, a and you have a 15 amp circuit we could calculate for example 15 amps times 120 volts to give us the power coming out of there which is like 1850 watts or something to that effect this is going to give you the value in watts which is equal to joules per second so here we know that the current in each of these the current flowing through the first one was still 4.5 amps they were both the voltage the voltage drop at least that was going through there was 0 0.335 or 375 volts Am I doing this wrong? I'm doing this wrong. Let's do this slightly different. What we know, based off this equation and off of this Ohm's Law equation, we can solve for our voltage there by taking, well, it's right here basically, V is equal to IR. I'm plugging that value in. So I times IR which is equal to I squared times R then we can find out how much power is dissipated through the extension cord so in this case it's 4.5 amps squared times the resistance which was 0 0.075 ohms Point five amps 
squared times 0 0.075 ohms is equal to 1.52 watts. Equal to 1.52 watts. Doing the same thing for the other one, same idea where P is equal to I squared R, which is going to be 4.5 amps squared times this one we had as a resistance of 0.15 ohms. There's it in there. Which is going to be equal to. Three point zero four watts. Three point zero four watts. So you can see there's <coughs> almost twice as much energy dissipated um, in the cheaper one versus you know the more expensive one. In this case, so let's look at another problem similar. We have a coffee maker. I like to drink coffee. I'm going to actually take a sip right now. The coffee maker has a resistance of 14 ohms. And it draws a current of 13 amps. So how much power does it use? So same idea as we had before. We have this relationship of Ohm's law, V is equal to IR. And we can connect that into power is equal to IV. Same way as before, power is going to end up being I squared R. And there's lots of ways to write power. You could substitute, here we're substituting in voltage for, for current and resistance, but we can also substitute in voltage over resistance for current, and we'd end up with V squared over R is also going to be equal to power. It just depends on what variables you have. So, plugging in this value, we have 13 amp circuit. It draws that much current. That's a lot of current to be drawing. And we have, squaring that, we have a resistance of 14 ohms. Only 14 ohms going through there. So, that is going to be 13 amps. And 13 ohms. No, 14 ohms. And the square would help. 2,366 watts. Two thousand three hundred sixty-six watts going through there. What about a toaster? This is a little different. They're telling us the wattage of the toaster. If you look at any of your appliances, your microwave, your toaster, your oven, it should tell you how much wattage she uses. You could pull your cell phone battery or charger out and look at it and tell you how much wattage it uses. And you could also find out its voltage and its amperage, and you could determine one from the other, or one from two of them at least. So here they will know how much does it cost to make a slice of toast cooking for 1.5 minutes. I feel like my toast is longer than that to cook in the morning. But here the energy costs 5 cents per kilowatt hour. So in this case, we're going to have to do a little bit of conversion. We've got watts, we've got kilowatt hours. So a kilowatt is 1,000 watts. And they, the power company charges you for how, how many watts you take per hour. So if you remember, watts is equal to joules per second. So, so if you multiply kilowatts by hours, you end up getting a value in joules, basically. You get energy. That's what they're charging you for, is energy, ultimately. So we can say that we have that 1,400 watts, and we want to multiply this by how many, 
how many hours essentially it's taking. But in this case, we're going to end up with seconds, so we get joules. So how many seconds it takes? 1.5 minutes times the conversion rate of 60 seconds per minute. Canceling out the units of minutes to get seconds. And you see this is going to equal, let's do our calculation here, 1400 watts. 1400 watts times 1.5 minutes times 60 seconds per minute is 126,000 joules. I can say that's 1.26 times 10 to the 5. I said with a question mark, but I just had to do the math. But that's right. Um, and now, if converted, our kilowatt hours, units of those, uh, we need to convert joules to kilowatt hours and have some, some conversion ratio there. So for kilowatt hours divided by, in this case, uh, a watt is a thousand joules per second and if we're multiplying that by an hour in seconds that's 60 times 60 seconds again so that's one hour times 60 minutes per hour times 60 seconds per minute which is equal to about 3,600 seconds so it's 600 seconds. I write this out to show you that the conversion rate basically between joules and kilowatt hours, because we need to convert our joules up there to kilowatt hours down here. And then ultimately we're going to use this 5 cents per kilowatt hour second. So putting all that in a row, I can say 1.26 times 10 to the 5th joules times, if I multiply that out, this is a kilowatt hour times, it would be 3.6 times 10 to the 6 joules. Notice my, my cents have canceled out and I end up with joules in the bottom there. So there's my conversion factor. And then I need to figure out how much it costs per kilowatt hour. So that's five cents per kilowatt hour. Canceling my units through. Now I can just multiply across the top, which is this value times five divided by the value. So is that value. I just multiply times oops, 5, and I want to divide by 3.6 times 10 to the 6, I said. We get 1.7, or sorry, 0 0.175 cents. And that is the cheap toast. 1.75 cents. I'm assuming that's for two pieces of toast because my toaster works two pieces at a time. So, but that's fine. That's the cost. That's how much it costs in the morning to make some toast. Okay. That's it. Okay. So here we have a North American tourist who's taking his 29 watt, 120 volt AC razor to Europe, and he finds a special adapter and plugs in to their 240 volt AC. Europe uses a higher voltage than we do here. Assuming a constant resistance, what power does the razor consume as the razor is being ruined? And <clears throat> a little bit of problem with this question, mainly because it says it's a special adapter. If it's really a special adapter, it would convert things properly. But um, let's say not so special adapter, and let's figure out what ruined his electric laser. So, similarly, 
we have this idea that P is equal to IV. And Ohm's law says V is equal to IR. In this case, we're going to be looking at this concept, changing this guy to voltage divided by resistance is equal to current. And we can take that value, plug it in over here to say that power is equal to V squared over R. And so now voltage is going to change from North America to Europe. The, the power consumption is going to end up changing, we'll see, from North America to Europe. But the resistance stays the same. So we can say, first finding out what, what is the power in North America. Well, that's going to equal the voltage in North America squared divided by whatever resistance value we have. And we can write that around a little bit because we know how much the power in North America consumes. So I can say that the resistance value is equal to the voltage squared from North America divided by the power consumption used in North America. And we know that, that North American voltage is 120 volts. We know that the power in North America is equal to 29 watts. So plugging that in here, our resistance is going to equal 120 volts squared divided by 29 watts. Let's see what that looks like. 120 volts squared divided by 29 watts. That should have been a 2 there and now it's divided by 29 watts 496.6 ohms that's equal to 496.6 ohms a little omega sign for ohms so that's the resistance and that stays current this is a constant resistance you're not going to change the device is unless it gets much hotter in your but say it's by average temperature the device stays the same resistance so we can then use that and use a similar relationship but for europe change colors for europe so if i say the power in the eu i don't know where in europe is going so i'm just going to say it's in the eu somewhere so not britain anymore the voltage there we know is 240 volts we're going to square that divide by the resistance that we know for 96.6 ohms and that's going to give us the power consumption how much power it's being consumed that's being consumed over there 240 volts let's see if I can square it properly and divide by uh, in this case we're dividing by resistance so let's paste this value in there and it gives me 116 watts. 116 watts for a device rated at 29 watts. So that's joules per second. So if we did a comparison of how much more it's really taking. This guy divided by that 29 watts is four. It's four times stronger than it is there. And we can see that in math. We can see that relationship here. Because we know that the voltage in North America, or say, let's say the voltage in Europe, is equal to twice the voltage in North America. So plugging in this value, even if we didn't know the resistance, Right? Assuming the resistance is constant, if we have power is equal to twice the voltage divided by the same resistance, okay, that's going to equal, oh, say, this is squared. <coughs> we can factor out and say that that's equal to 4 times the initial ratio of voltage to resistance, because 2 times 2 is 4, squaring that 2, keeping this V squared over R. So that initial power, this is the initial power, and this here is the difference between Europe and uh, the U.S. or North America somewhere. Could be Canada. We don't know. 
So that's just a relationship of that, that there. That shows us that because you use four times much wattage as it is there. But that's the wattage that they're asking for. And then we ask, why is it being ruined? Well, there's four times as much power going into there. And all the resistors and all the wires and stuff like that, they're rated for 29 watts. They're designed to get that small wattage. So you give them that much energy pumping through them, they're going to start to smoke and explode, and the razor is going to stop working. Mm -hmm. So that is all I have for you today. Um, let me paste in that attendance sheet again for anyone who might be watching. Make sure to fill that out, and, and uh, I've often or I've dropped in hours between 4:30 and 5:30 today. So drop in, ask some questions there, or make an appointment in the Pinji app. There should be a link right up me to schedule an appointment with myself or other physics tutors, and we're all happy to help you with anything that you have questions on. Thank you again, and enjoy.